Two high school students, Kelsia Johnson and Akia Jackson at St. Mary's Academy gave a new proof of the Pythagorean Theorem. This is a remarkable feat for two kids in high school and they gave a presentation at the AMS Southeast Regional Conference held at Georgia Tech. The story has been picked up by several local news outlets. The reports that I saw, the presenters themselves could do with a bit of math review. He's a scientist! Triangle. No, 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 I failed high school <laughs> geometry. Can you give us a sense to try and break it down for, you know, maybe a, on a third grade level? If, I remember grade. that formula, but like putting it into use. But, you know, that's fine. However, the public's interpretation seems to be a bit off the mark. Some people are confused and wondering if we didn't know how to prove the Pythagorean theorem before. What was Johnson and Jackson's contribution here? And is their claim that they used only trigonometry and not geometry ultimately circular reasoning? That is what is known as circular logic. Johnson and Jackson haven't actually submitted the manuscript for review yet, uh, if they've even written it up at all. And only the few people that actually attended their talk really knows what they did. But there's enough out there that we can make a fairly good guess at what their approach was. And honestly, it's pretty fun. Let's break down what's going on here. I'll, I'll show you how we usually think of the Pythagorean theorem, and then we'll get into their actual proof. Or at least what we extrapolate from the couple of photos and the abstract submitted to the conference. Now, Greek mathematicians are credited with the invention of proof and logic. This started with Thales and his proof about an inscribed triangle around, say, 500 BC, and the Pythagorean theorem was proven almost immediately after this, making it one of the oldest pieces of mathematics that we actually know of. But it's likely that the theorem itself was known before the Greeks began their journey into mathematics. We have clay tablets from the Babylonians that describe what we call Pythagorean triples, those are triples of numbers like 3, 4, 5 that satisfies a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. That's 9 plus 16 is equal to 25. And so this was cataloged in a clay tablet by the Babylonians. Now, those are just special cases, and the Pythagorean theorem tells us that for any right triangle, the square of the length of the hypotenuse is the sum of the squares of the lengths of the two legs. Or, as is more commonly known, a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. Mathematicians have come back to this theorem over and over again in the last 2,500 years, and we have accumulated hundreds of proofs of this. Famously, while he was serving as a member of Congress in 1876, James Garfield furnished his own proof of the Pythagorean theorem and then later became the President of the United States. That is outside of the scope of anything that I expect a US President to be able to do. Elisha Loomis collected 256 proofs of the Pythagorean Theorem in his textbook, The Pythagorean Proposition, which was published in 1940, and that list isn't even exhaustive today. If you want to track down a copy of that textbook, it can run you as much as $1,400 on Amazon today. Thankfully, it was preserved in microfilm and is actually available for free through a government repository. I'll put a link to the textbook in the description here. So with all these mathematicians attacking the problem, what could Johnson and Jackson possibly have found that no one else did. Apparently, all the theorems in Limbus's book all sit firmly in geometry. That is, never before has a proof been discovered that was purely trigonometric. Or at least that's the claim in Loomis, uh, which is quoted in Johnson and Jackson's abstract as, There are no trigonometric proofs because all of the fundamental formulae of trigonometry are themselves based upon the truth of the Pythagorean theorem. These girls took this as a challenge and furnished a proof that rested on the law of signs. With this hint and this footage from the event, I think we can make a reasonable guess at what their proof was. But before we do that, let's look at a typical proof of the Pythagorean theorem. This won't take long. It's actually much simpler than Johnson and Jackson's proof. We want to prove a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared for a right triangle with two legs of length a and b and a hypotenuse of length c. Very naturally, when we see squares here, we frequently think of areas. So let's look at the area of the triangle. And that's going to be a times b divided by 2. Now, let's say we have four of them and we arrange them like this. We line up the a and b sides to give us a square of length a plus b. The total area of that is a plus b squared, and a bit of algebra tells us that this is a squared plus b squared plus 2ab. But if we look closely, we can see that we have a square of side length c within this figure. And then we also have our four triangles. So this area is also c squared plus 4 times ab over 2, or c squared plus 2ab. Cancel 2 times AB on both sides, and we win. 
Now let's look at the Johnson Jackson proof, but to figure that out, we first need to reverse engineer what they did from this photo. Now, I'm not the first to do this. While I was putting this video together, I saw the channel Math Train also reverse engineered the proof. I'll put a link to his video in the description if you want to see what he has to say after you finish watching my video. As indicated in their abstract, this proof relies on the law of science. And if we look closely at this figure, we can see a geometric progression. That means we're going to need a geometric summation formula. This is a really neat figure. After I saw what they were doing, I was actually quite impressed. Looking at the geometric progression, we see that we are going to need a over b to be less than 1. Otherwise, this isn't going to converge at all. That means we need one of the sides to be smaller for this to work. This leaves one case that we need to dispatch with first, when the side lengths are equal. And this is going to use the law of sines. We can exploit similarity to reduce us to the case of each of the legs having length 1. The law of sines says that if we take sine of any angle and divide it by the length of its opposite side, then the quantity doesn't change no matter which angle we start with. With this triangle, we have two 45 degree angles and a 90 degree angle. And since we have side lengths of one, the law of sine gives us sine of 45 degrees is equal to sine of 90 degrees divided by C. Well, sine of 90 degrees is one and sine of 45 degrees is one over square root of two. So c is equal to square root of 2. We can then verify that 1 squared plus 1 squared is equal to 2, which is the same as the square root of 2 squared. And that case is done. Now for the interesting case, when one side is smaller than the other. Let's assume that a is less than b, since we can always just relabel them. So we start with the top of this figure and mirror the triangle about the b leg. Now we have a larger triangle and its base is of length 2a. To this, we're going to add another right triangle, and we're going to drop it in with an alpha angle adjacent to the 2a side. What this does is it makes a 90 degree angle when combined with the beta on the other side. So we're actually making a right triangle here. So this triangle is similar to the first, since it has the same angles. When we adjust for scaling, this gives this side as having a length 2a squared divided by b. From here on, things get simpler. We take a copy of our first triangle, scale it, and place it on the right here. We see that the hypotenuse of that new triangle is 2a squared divided by b squared and that times c. We do this all again and we see that the next hypotenuse is 2 times a to the fourth divided by b to the fourth and all that times c and so on. Since a is less than b, we see that these lengths are going to zero and are actually summable because it gives us a geometric series. In fact, since we can already see that this is going to be the hypotenuse of our new triangle, let's go ahead and figure out what the length should be. We almost have the series of 2c times a squared divided by b squared raised to the nth power, uh, summing from n equals 0 to infinity, which would sum to 2c divided by 1 minus a squared divided by b squared. And what we're missing is a second c from our first hypotenuse. So the actual length is that sum minus c. After a bit of simplification, we get uh, 2c times b squared divided by b squared minus a squared, and then that quantity minus c. And after finding a common denominator, we get c times b squared plus a squared divided by b squared minus a squared. And that is very heartening because we are starting to see that a squared plus b squared pop up in here. Now we know from the abstract that the law of sines should show up here. We have two other sides of the triangle that we could compare with using the law of sines. However, one side we don't actually know the length of unless we already know the Pythagorean theorem. So we have to use the other one, which has like C. Let's call the angle at the very, very tip, at the very bottom here, uh, gamma. And so then what we get is we get the sine of gamma divided by C is equal to the sine of 90 degrees divided by the length of our new hypotenuse. And this becomes a sine of gamma divided by C is equal to one divided by our new hypotenuse because sine of 90 degrees is one. And since gamma itself is 90 degrees minus twice of alpha, we can change sine of gamma to cosine of two alpha using the co-function identity. And then using the double angle formula, we get cosine squared of alpha minus sine squared of alpha, which then becomes b over c squared minus a over c squared. Let's plug that in and start canceling. We have b squared minus a squared in the numerator of both sides. And after canceling and moving the c squared over, we are done. 
That is very slick. And I really want to congratulate Johnson and Jackson for coming up with this proof. I think that's a remarkable achievement for two kids who are just in high school. It really shows you that there are opportunities to discover something new everywhere in mathematics. Now, is this circular reasoning? Isn't trigonometry a consequence of geometry? Well, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. I actually made a video that demonstrates that all of trigonometry can be derived from calculus and differential equations. So in a sense, the Pythagorean theorem is then a consequence of calculus. If you want to see that video, you can catch it here. In any case, I want to thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.